Stallion, live events change lives. No doubt about it. That's why we want you to join us for a live event here in Birmingham, January 6th through the 8th. Go to wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash live. Hey, we're going to give you access to our network and the other people within the community so that you can have the exact blueprint on how to become financially free. The same one the Stallion and I have been using to post our passive income report every single month. Don't miss this opportunity. Go to wealthwallstreet.com for slash live. Don't start the new year with a goal. Start the new year with a plan to accomplish your goal. Stallion, today's podcast, we're going to break down what is the Wall Street way and why it's wrong. Now, you didn't get a chance to participate, but you have participated in the Wall Street way. I I, I feel like I saved you. I threw you a stinking uh, life preserver <laughs> like 13 years ago that got you out of this. And I, for people who are trying to determine how do they get out of Wall Street, why is Wall Street bad? What are some of the conversations you're hearing on calls as people reach out to our company? Well, I, I mean, I'll, I'll go ahead and say this first. I'm sad I wasn't a part of this conversation because I had all the same thoughts going through my mind 15 years ago, right? Well, this sounds good, this whole different way away from Wall Street, but is it, isn't Wall Street safe? Like, is it it's safe because there's all these other people doing the same thing? Like, they, everybody can't be wrong. <laughs> right. So can I, can I, can I just keep some of the 401k? Should I, should I get completely out of the 401k? I don't want to really take those tax penalties. I don't want the, um, the tax hit all at one time. Like how, like wh what are, what are those tax penalties? I mean, there's all these things going through my mind. What, what, what would people think if I didn't do this? What would people think in my HR department if I told them I didn't want the match because I didn't want to contribute money to this anymore? Because when they asked me why, I said, well, because it doesn't create passive income. And they go, well, how are you going to create passive income? What if I don't know? Right. What if I've not figured out what my investor DNA is? What if I don't know out of all the different options that are out there, which one are the best fits for me, both financially, but also in the way that I see the world? Yeah, those, exactly. And by the way, if you'd asked me that 15 years ago, I had no answers. Right. Yeah. I had no exposure to experts who already had built passive income portfolios in long term rentals, short term rentals, land flipping, e commerce. Like, all these things that you and I've gathered over the last 15 years, those things were not easily accessible immediately. And they were causing me, you know, to, to kind of hole up. Like, I don't really know what to do. I just know I don't want to keep doing what I've always done and expecting a different result. Well, I think that that's what's wrong with Wall Street, right? It never encourages you to learn. It never encourages you to get out of that pain. It's just everybody else is in it. You just get to deal with it too, right? It's like sitting at a football game the other night, watching my nephew play. It's Friday night football in Alabama, but it is cold at night. Like you got down into the high thirties and everybody's just freezing and miserable, right? And you're just like, okay, well, this is what I'm going to do. No, that's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to stink and take a propane heater. And I was going to be the one sitting in there totally cool with the, having a propane heater, like pouring uh, heat at me. And that's what I did. I was warm. Everybody else was freaking miserable. No, I'm not going to do it. Well, here's a key saying. You and I know that it doesn't take 15 years to do this because you and I have already taken the pain um, of going and finding out what all these options are. We've right. found a way to present this in a way, not only through the podcast, but also through live events. We're about to have a live event coming up in the beginning of January. What are some of the things that people will be able to take away as a participant of that? Well, this, this is where all the th question marks that we just got done talking about become exclamation points, right? Mm -hmm. I no longer have to wonder about my investor DNA because we're going to cover that. We're going to cover how that investor DNA then gets involved in these different passive income streams. Like maybe at that point you become clear and say, I'm going to either go all in on long-term rentals and I'm going to be able to get to meet people that will take a $25,000 investment and build a million dollar portfolio of properties in one year. Like it's that, if that doesn't get you fired up, then we're probably talking a different language right now. Or maybe you want to build an e-commerce brand like one of our members, Daniel Espy, that's now created over $4 million of top line revenue in less than two years. Like 
you're going to be able to sit with the person who coached him one-on-one at this event. Like that is, that's unbelievable value right there. Is it, is it cool? Is it cool if I kind of give the giveaway here? Like what I love is that each one of these participants, each one of these speakers who's coming said, Hey, how can we give back to your community? And they have offered to give one slot in a drawing within the event. We're going to draw live one slot each into one of their coaching programs that go from 10,000 all the way up to $35,000 to be a part of it. So it's a lot of times people are like trying to figure out how do I get into these programs? Cause, Cause I see you guys interviewing Daniel Esby. I see you interviewing Michaela Sorney. I see you interviewing Toby Kamir, all these people who have built amazing streams of income through these sort of speakers. And our speakers are going to be given away access that they, they, they charge big money for people to participate in because they want to make sure they're investing in these people one-on-one over a 12-month time frame in a lot of situations. As an um, attendee, you will get entered into that drawing. So, Joey, I know this is going long. I hate that you didn't get a, a chance to participate in this, but I, I want everybody to take time, just like the ad at the very beginning said, go to westwildwallstreet.com forward slash live. Don't miss out January the 6th through the 8th to participate, to hang out with the Stallion and I live, but more importantly, to get the clarity you need in 2023 to start on your path to becoming financially free. Stallion, pull up your chair. Let's belly up. Welcome to the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast, your guide to understanding how to get out of the Wall Street rat race and start your own mailbox money lifestyle. Now, don't let these handsome Southern draws fool you. These financial minds are teaching our country to enhance savings, increase cash flow, and create passive income, all without the help of Wall Street. Are you ready to break through? Now here are your hosts, Russ Morgan and Joey Murray. Welcome into the Financial Freedom Roundtable, where each week we break down complex financial topics so that you can more easily understand them and more importantly, take action on your path to becoming financially free. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. Grateful to have you in the room. I'm Russ Morgan. They call me the idea guy, mostly because lack of follow through guy or bad internet guy just didn't sound so cool. Now, enough about me for a second, though. I am thankfully sitting around the table with some of the greatest financial coaches in North America. To my left, I got Mr. Incredible, his superpower, speed to financial freedom, the real beauty of that speed is just contagious, my man, J.D. Hill. Say hello to your fans, J.D. Hey, fans. Hey, Jamie. Thanks for waving back, buddy. Always. <laughs> I like that. I like Jamie. We should have invited him a long time ago. <laughs> we should have, man. I'm grateful that he's in. I'm grateful that he's here. But he's another really rainmaker. Quicker. Before we get to Jamie, can, can okay. I press pause and ask you one question? Ask me anything. What exactly is the Wall Street way and why is it wrong? That's a loaded question. Uh, and I am ready to, to load that gun and fire it. Um, listen, the Wall Street way, because I used to be a part of that Wall Street way, uh, is uh, designed to where only the people managing the money make the money. Mm. Like, let's just call it what it is, right? Mm. Uh, only the people that are making money in this deal are the ones at the top managing the money. Listen up, everybody. This podcast is going to be lit, is what the kids say, because this this is definitely coming off the top rope. A lot of conversation that needs to be talked about today, right? Especially of all days, whenever we see the markets completely in flux, we see uh, interest rates through the roof. We see um, confusion at the kitchen table. Man, I'm so grateful that we're going to be talking about this. But let's don't stop with you. Let me get over to your left. I got a true financial Sherlock Holmes of our day. No problem too difficult to solve. If I'd only known him earlier, I'd been so much richer, said everybody. Mr. Downtown Ernie Brown. Nice to see you, Ern. Man, good to be seen. Glad to be here. This is like, everybody should should know this. If this is the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast and we're talking about Wall Street, we kind of know how this is going to go. <laughs> this, this is, this is no gloves, bare knuckle mm. boxing today. How fun is that? Yeah, th- this is, this is 
street fighting, man. This is, this, this is, you know, uh, when I was, when I was a kid, you know, they, you'd have just a couple of these battle rump, ba- battle rumbles, you know, uh, the WWE type stuff. Man, fun, fun times on the trampoline for sure. <laughs> you can have some smackdowns. I know what you're talking about. Uh, All right. Well, let, let's get around the table here. You got the retiree of the group. Mr. Catch Me If You Can. When he's not killing bears with his bare hands, the spirit of Ivan Fortuna is right here dropping gold nuggets. The one and only Mark Caraguchi. Welcome, Mark. Good afternoon. And, you know, if, if we're talking about, you know, the, the, the Wall Street way and why it's wrong, um, I mean, I, I just had a, a very nice uh, sum of money transferred into my account after a off Wall Street lending deal just came to fruition. So that was pretty nice uh, because the, the the alternative, right, the, the Wall Street way, which is what we're talking about, in my opinion, uh, can be encapsulated into the phrase of give me your money and just be thankful that I took it. Heads I win, tails you lose. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I think there's a lot of that. It's going to come out today, too. All right. Well, good to have you here. Let me let me get around here. We got the king of Beham, Mr. Real Estate. He's agnostic to his type as long as it produces cash flow. The multi-talented Jamie O'Brien. Good to see you, Jamie. Good to see you, Russ. How's it going? Man, I'm grateful, man. Grateful to be here with you talking about a subject that is very near and dear to my heart. I used to be in the Wall Street way, so I feel like I, I have the ability to to speak a little bit to it. But why do you think this is such an important topic for us to cover? Man, you know, when I was first getting started, uh, everybody told me just put money away, you know, put it in these plans and, and one day you'll be able to retire and live the life you want. One day. One day, unless that day is today or mm-hmm. 2008. And unfortunately, mm-hmm. I think a lot of people are feeling that pain right now. Um, and I knew that I wanted to live a life that I wanted to live way before the government told me I could. Uh, amen. I, I feel like this is going to be in one of those moments where you're sitting in church next to the old lady and it, it's just, the preacher is given uh, an amazing, an amazing blessing. And she's sitting next to you going, mm, mm, amen. Let's do it. Talk I to hear you. Me. I hear you. <laughs> All right. Let, let's bring the last one in the group, the surgeon. He, he has a precision-like approach to cash flow, and he can diagnose problems before they even occur just by looking at your financial statement. Mm. Mr. Automated Budget, Mr. Eric Hudson. Great to have you on, Eric. Thank you, Russ, so much. You know, when I think about this topic, me being the surgeon and medical professional that I am, I think about <laughs> times that um, I've gone to see my doctor. And, you know, I've taken, I've taken my doctor, my, probably my most important asset, myself, my health, and we've run tests and we've looked at those uh, results and made a plan. And could you imagine if my doctor said, Hey, in regards to your health, whatever you do, I don't want you to look at those numbers that we've just um, come up with. I don't, I don't want you to be looking into your health too much. I think maybe we ought to just check in once a year. And other than that, just don't even look at it. I think that's probably what's going to be best for you. Don't even think about it. Mm. Would you believe that that is the exact advice of one of the top five financial firms to a very close personal family friend of mine who has a million dollars invested with them? Mm. Hey, please don't be looking at your money every day. Please don't looking at your investments every day. I fear for your mental health if you do that. <laughs> Oh, I Gosh, mean, apply that scenario to any other situation in your life and you would go, oh, my God, no, no yeah. that's not going to be OK with me. Here, here's the, the thing with that here. If if people understand the problem, they'll know what to do. Right. And I think that Wall Street has recognized that is that they may realize that they're the problem. <laughs> if people really start digging into this too deeply, what they're going to figure out is, wait a second, these knuckleheads don't know more than I know about the money. And really, it's in their best interest, the the less I do know. That's exactly it. Oh, man. Well, there's, there's going to be a lot of conversation of buses here, okay? We're, we're going to show people how to take control and uh, drive the bus. Now, some of us may be literally riding on the bus, and some of us have been thrown under the bus and backed up over a couple of times. So let's try to make sure we we not only share opinions and share 
but experiences. Let's share some stories. Let's let's open up. Maybe the person who's listening to this for the very first time says, "I, I was told to go listen to this podcast, Wealth Without Wall Street. I don't even know what that is. I don't understand why they're talking about the Wall Street way and why it's wrong until we break down some of these stories, some of these concepts. Earn. I'm going to let you start off because I, I know you're going to come off the top rope. Bring it for me. I mean, I think one of the one of the things that we look at in the Wall Street way is just the fascination of diversion. <laughs> we we sit with these financial advisors or we listen to financial gurus and we listen to the conversation about interest rates, portfolio allocations, stock bond allocations. And, and that seems that stuff seems so difficult to us. <laughs> that we say, there's no way I could figure that on my, out on my own. I need the help of a financial professional. I need to be entrusting my dollars uh, into an institution that can manage this for me because that's, that stuff's way over my head. And so we get, we get distracted. We say, hey, look at all this stuff going over here. That's, that's really difficult to understand. When over here, on the other hand, we're getting dollars siphoned off on fees just to play the game. And man, isn't that a huge problem? in our markets today yeah there's a distraction out there of what what to do with these different percentages and oh there must be a specific percentage that applies to everyone so what is it for me so that i can apply right that's right and and but not only that not just apply it today but you got to keep changing it (laughs) right the older you get you got to keep tweaking that you got to keep tweaking those percentages keep you coming back to the table for dependence upon advice well and financial advice is trash. It's garbage. You need to be treated as such. It, it comes from one perspective, right? As you're listening to each one of us share a thought, we're going to share you with you experience that we personally have. But I always tell people, hey, look, when you see our passive income report and you see five or 10 different things on there, don't go pick one of those just because that's what we're doing. You need to lead from a position of experience and education. And if you don't have it, don't have it, you got to go get it right then. And only then should you be thinking about what you should invest in. Mark, talk to me a little bit, because I, I know sometimes people uh, feelings uh, drive a lot of their decision making. What would you add to the subject? I believe the the feeling perspective comes in regardless of what the market is doing. If, if if the market appears to be going up, there's there's a FOMO, a fear of missing out. Hey, you got to put your money in. You got to get in. You got to get it. I mean, this, this thing is going up, up, up. There's only one way to go. And then once you get the top to the top of the roller coaster and it starts coming down, well, then there's the FOMO of, well, if, 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 if I get out now, I'm, I'm just going to be losing. I mean, look at everything I'm going to quote lose if I get out now. So if, if I'm supposed to buy, buy, buy while the market is rising, um, but when the market falls, I'm never supposed to sell. When am I actually supposed to sell to get off of this merry-go-round? When is this this system supposed to be a good time to get out? Because I've never heard anybody give me to to Ernie's point, right? That the percent allocation, that strategic plan that that they come up with, I've never heard the answer as to when you're actually supposed to get out. Because it's always, oh, you shouldn't sell now because look look, look at what you're going to miss out on. So you're, you're, you're constantly being put into a box in the corner of a fear of missing out one way or another. And I, for everyone who's not watching on YouTube, I'm, you're missing out because what Mark is describing is a chart I've seen a hundred times. I went and found it on the internet and, you know, tradersfly.com are going to get some pub here. I, I don't know who crap that is, by the way. But I, I saw this chart 15 years ago when I was in the financial world. And I looked at it and I said, exactly what you were just talking about. As prices go up, we think, oh man, I've missed, I've missed it. You know, I'm, I'm going to wait for it to start slowly going down a little bit so that I can start increasing my position. Right. And as it continues to drop, it's like, oh man, I tell you what, whenever it goes back up, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and sell at that point. And then they, they watch it all the way to the bottom and they go, oh, good thing I sold everything. Oh, man, I'm glad I got out there, you know, a couple percentage points higher. And then as it goes up a little bit, oh, this thing's going to tank again. And they, they see it drop. Oh, I told you it's going to go down. And they start seeing it go up. And they're like, oh, man, these people are about to get just 
take it to the cleaners. And then what do they do? They get wait to see it go all the way back up to the top. And they're like, I better buy again before, it's, before, it, before it goes up any further. And what I have experienced when I was in the belly of the beast, when I was a financial advisor, when I was a certified financial planner, is that people buy and hold on. And what I mean by that is that they buy and never sell. They never sell. They don't sell when it's up. They don't sell when it's down. They only sell when they have to. When they've gotten to a point where they need money, they've lost their job. They have to sell. And at that point, it's usually bad, right? Usually when those sort of things are happening, they're not just happening to you. They're happening to a lot of other people. And usually it's not a good time in the market. And I think that the Wall Street way is built for the buy and hold on. Hey, we're going to ride this roller coaster up and down. But the only people benefiting, as you said earlier, J.D., at the very beginning, are the managers themselves, right? Those fees keep coming. There's a reason why in 2009, 2010, all the 401k plans out there were restructured so that in-service withdrawals were taken away. Now, if you don't know what an in-service withdrawal is because you never got access to one, <laughs> and you will never get access to one again, that was the ability, if you had a 401k at your company, to be able to go to the company prior to like still working there and actually access money in your 401k and be able to pull it out and go do something else with it. Not, not necessarily withdraw it unless you wanted to, but you could move it. You could roll it. You could do something else with it. Well, the, 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 the fund managers out there recognized in 2008, 2009, when the markets were crashing and those balances they were getting paid percentages off of were 50% of what they were. And then people were getting nervous at the bottom and starting to take money out because they had lost their jobs. They said, man, we got to create some provisions here that's going to keep us from ever having that happen to us again. And by us, I mean Wall Street. <laughs> So we're going to we're going to go in there and redo all the contracts with all the employers and say, hey, by the way, um, this is the way it goes going forward. You don't want your employees taking money out of their 401ks um, when they're not 59 and a half. They're going to spend the money. They're not going to have it for retirement. It's going to make them more stressed out. And so they did away with all the in-service withdrawals. And so the only people that were making money along the way were the Wall Street advisors. Now, I know I'm not the only one with that thought process, right? Talk to me, JD. What's what's your thoughts on this? Well, I guess I got a number of thoughts. So if if I told you, Russ, that you were gonna hire someone that was part of an industry where 80% of the people in that industry underperformed their underperformed their benchmark, would you want to hire anybody in that industry? Is a 20% success rate, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, that's bad. I mean, 30% is good in baseball. Uh, 20% is no good. Uh, this is, this is a real report, right? You can, you can, you can look this up. Okay. 80% of us fund managers underperform the S and P 500. Like, how is that a good thing? That's awful. Literally it's terrible. And, and it, as a guy that was one of the ones that managed money for people, Right. Like I, I did that. I, I, I got to, to charge people an advisory fee. After a while, you get to this place where you're like, wait a minute, this something seems off here. Anytime somebody calls me and says, Hey, I need cash. I'm like, no, 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 you can't take any money out right now. We're doing really well. Or somebody needs cash. You can't take money out right now because the market's not doing too well. You need to actually buying right now. Mm -hmm. The answer was always no. Right. I'm always telling them no as if it was my money to begin with. So the irony of it is, is that as the advisor, I, I, I take all the control away from people. I take no risk. None of my money is invested. And yet I get to spend all the money right away because I'm mm -hmm. charging you an advisory fee. And whether your account goes up or your account goes down, I still get my advisory fee. It's well, the rawest deal I've ever been a part of. This podcast is amazing, almost too amazing, Russ. There's too many ideas, and I don't know where to get started creating passive income. Well, here's the thing, Joey. I think one of the things you need to consider in that statement is what is it costing you to not know? What is it costing you not to take action? I love the statement that says you don't have to be great to start. You just have to start to be great. If you're struggling on where to start, you have to know what type of investor you are. Know your investor DNA. 
And if you want to learn more about this, you can join us in our Passport Challenge at wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash passport. Get started today. You're, the way you get paid is in direct conflict to what's best for them. It 100%. always was. I, I remember having a conversation with a couple. They lived in um, Tupelo, Mississippi. And at the time, uh, they were one of the bigger accounts we had. I'd, I'd driven all the way over there. It was a decent drive from Birmingham. Sat in their, sat in their living room. And we were talking about what was getting ready to happen, what what seemed to be, you know, at the time, a big election. This was 2007, right? Preparing for, for some things happening um, in 2008. And they were getting a little skittish. They were saying, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about what's going to happen and, and what the election may, uh, how that may change our economy. And some of the things that are going on are like, no, the last thing we want to do is take money out of the market, Right. That is just not a good idea. We might want to reallocate, change our percentages, right? The same garbage we were just talking about a second ago. The last thing we want to do is take it out. And I remember in September of 2008, when the market crashed, I thought about that conversation I'd had with them. I thought about the fact that I, I had sat there and given them words of encouragement to stay and now their accounts were 30 to 35% less than they were when we had talked a month and a half, two months before. And I just thought, man, this is, this is really, this is sad. Now I didn't do it on purpose. I didn't think that it was going to go down 35%, but at that point in time, getting out of the market didn't make sense anymore. Right? Like, well, if we get out now, we're going to accept the loss. We just need to ride it out. And then we went into the lost decade. Jamie, you have some personal experience with this too. Man, I do. I'm a big believer in learning from other people's mistakes, um, paying attention to what's happening around you and, and trying to find a better way. And so, um, you know, I started my real estate journey several, several years ago now, and, and I just wanted more control over my capital and being able to use it. And that story comes back to 2008. You know, uh, the old saying goes, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. Um, yeah, I remember it vividly in around 08, watching and talking to my father about how he had lost 40% of his net worth practically overnight. Mm -hmm. And this is a very smart man, very successful man who took a lot of pride in hiring and paying for good advice. That was what he always told me is pay for good advice. And his investment manager or money manager, whatever you want to call him, I'll never forget this quote, told him the only way you're going to get out of this is the way you got in. And he just retired last year. And here we are in the same exact situation that we were faced with in 08 or a very similar one. Let me put it that way. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it hurts me a little bit to, to talk about it because it is my father. Right. And, and you would think, you know, as I learned and as I grow, it's trying to show him alternative investments to control that capital and put it to work in other places and, and diversify if you will. But, um, sometimes you just can't teach an old dog new tricks. So I have no idea what his exact situation is. And I, you know, I don't really want to ask. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately that gets really close to home. I make a quick comment real quick. I, I don't want it to sound like, um, you know, I'm demonizing the advisor. Right. But in, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not, I'm not disparaging or saying that the advisors managing the money are bad people. Right. I think the system and the way that it's set up other than you. Right. And I think the system and I'm kidding. I think the system and the way that it's set up is it sets that it sets it up to be that way. Absolutely. Right. And, and so it's not the, in other words, I don't think I was a bad advisor for the people that I was trying to help. Cause I had their best interest at heart. Like I was actually trying to help them based on how I was taught and trained. And mm -hmm. I only knew what I knew. I didn't know anything else other than what I was taught and trained to do. And so I don't think advisors are inherently bad people. I just think they're in a system that they don't know any different. A hundred percent. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I think, I think we, we don't know what we don't know. Right. You know, we know the world that we live in and we, that surrounds us. And to your point, what we've been taught to do. And if you don't look for a better way, there is only one way, right? So let, let's go into, let's, can we stop right there and just talk a little bit this, JD, because you and I spent time in this. What, what Jamie just said is they only know what they were taught to do. 
Where were you and I taught from? Who taught us? Uh, Wall Street. Wall Street, right? The mutual fund wholesalers would come into our offices and talk about the funds that we were able to sell, and they would talk to us and teach us about them, right? That's right. Hey, were you That's ever right. going out on your own and just like seeking your own information and learning on your own about how to do all these things? Or was it just sitting in a classroom setting where you had a wholesaler teaching you about the fund, talking to you about the alpha, the beta, the standard deviation, the, all the different risk profiles, right? All the Greek the, letters, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the tenure of the fund managers, right? The track record of the funds itself. That, that's where we were taught. We were literally being taught. It, it would, I mean, again, I, I know this could be a touchy subject. It, it would be like taking vaccination advice from Pfizer, right? Like, I mean, what else are they going to tell you? That's right. Right. I, I mean, whether it doesn't matter what side you're on of it, right? What, what, what do you think the fund manager is going to tell you? Hey, by the way, this is not a good idea. Of course they're not. That, that's how they get sold. And we were sitting there learning from them. There was no, our, our, we, we were not encouraged by our broker dealers. We were not encouraged by the investment firms we worked in to go out and seek other ways. Am I wrong? No, you're not wrong. Because it, it, again, mutual fund managers, everybody gets paid based on how much money you have under management. Like that, that's how they set up the entire system. It's all based on the volume of assets that you're managing, assets under management, AUM. It's a, it's a common term that's used in the industry is how much AUM do you have or assets under management? And then everybody gets paid a fee off of that. The compliance officer gets paid a fee off of that. The, the fund managers are getting paid a fee off of that. You're getting paid a fee off of that, right? Everybody's getting paid off of the assets under management. And, and so you have implied fees and, and explicit fees and like you have all these different fees, but everything is based on how many dollars you can raise. So they all tell a compelling story, right? We're this good because of these things that we do. Mm. Hey, Eric, I want to come to you, but really quickly, what you just said, Jamie, it, there, there's a, a little stat out there. And if everybody want to Google this, type in, in, in Google sequence of returns risk. And that's a little known subject that isn't talked about a lot and is definitely not going to be talked about right now with the people who are quote unquote retiring because the sequence of return risk, what it does, it talks about the real risk in retirement is the sequence of the returns. So somebody could say, well, hey, JD, you know, we're going through a dip right now. But the reality is, over the next 20 years, we're going to average a 10% return. But yet, in the first two to three years, if you experience negative returns in retirement, your portfolio will nosedive because of sequence of return risk. The importance in the timing of when those returns happen as a relationship to you pulling money out. And I think that that's a big issue right now, considering that we have 10,000 baby boomers retiring every single day and, and it's growing, right? Over the next six to seven years, there's a lot of people out there, just like you were saying, Jamie, like your dad, who's experiencing that. And that's, that's a scary position. Will my money run out? That's the number one concern of anyone who has left the job force in the quote unquote Wall Street way of just trying to spin down their assets. Eric, I know you also have some personal experience here. You want to share it with us? Yeah. So there's a little verse in the Bible, Russ, that talks about not being unequally yoked. Hmm. So uh, if you want to boil that down to Birmingham, Alabama language, uh, maybe that's don't be in a bad partnership. I remember <laughs> starting at, you know, when you're young, you're 20, you're starting at your first company. They're offering you all these benefits. It's amazing. And here's something you can, we can set some savings aside. There's going to be a match and we're going to help you build your retirement over the next 40 years. Well, I, I don't know about that. What if something happens to the company? Oh, no, no, don't worry about that. This money is yours, has nothing to do with the company. You can do with it uh -oh. whatever you want. This is your money. Oh, okay, great. Well, can I take it out if I need to? Mm, well, not till 59 and a half, or you've actually left the company because your partner that you're in partnership with says you can't. 
Oh, who's that? Uh, the, the U.S. government. You, you can't take it out. Okay, I finally made it through that. I worked 40 years, got me a big balloon of savings, and um, I'm now to the point I'm retired and I'm using it. But remember that graph you just showed where the market's moving up and down and people don't know when to sell or or or, or, or whatever? Well, the good thing about that graphic was that you had a choice, at least on that graph, when you could sell. Well, imagine you're like my sweet mother right now. She is 72 years old. The market is down. She doesn't need the money right now. But what is her partner telling her, Russ? Oh, hang tight. Her partner, the U.S. government, is saying, Ms. Hudson, you must take the money out. It doesn't matter that the market has dipped down 20% and you've lost 20% of your dollars. You've got to take your dollars out now in the form of required minimum distributions. But, Mr. Mm -hmm. Government, I don't need it. doesn't matter. you got to take it out now. A loss sequence, um, the sequence of investing. I'm sorry, the term left me that you said a while ago, but sequence of return risk, sequence of return risk, mm. forced yeah. sequence of return risk. Hey, hey, here's I, I want to many of us listening to this right now have parents that are at that 60 to 80 year range, right? And and they are not listening to this podcast, most likely they don't even know how to spell podcast. And I don't mean that derogatory. They just don't understand what podcasts are. Um, you know, Joey made the joke about our moms downloading this podcast a million times. That's how he hit a million. And I can't lie. I don't think my mom's ever listened to the podcast. So she didn't know how to open the app. Right. But he, here's one of the things that we can do for them because I, I don't know if you guys remember all in the family. Isn't just a 70 sitcom. It's an opportunity for us to help our parents with this position that they're in. In 2007, as the market started to crash, the financials, um, the banks were the first one. They were the leading edge of the, of the crash. Most people didn't experience it personally or think it happened until September 2008. That's where we saw a big drop. But if you looked at the financial stocks, you saw them losing value Starting back in 2007, they were starting to nosedive. By the time we got to the middle of 2008, most of them had lost 40 to 50% of their value. And I was managing funds for my father-in-law. One of the stocks that he had was Bank of America. And I had put a stop loss on this stock to where if it dropped more than 15%, it would sell half of it. If it dropped more than 25%, it would, it would sell the other half. And when he gave it to me, I said, hey, by the way, I'm going to do this little thing. But I mean, it's never going to drop, so it doesn't matter. But it was, you know, that was what I was taught to do. Good little little, little tactic, okay? And the first the first 15% um, hit, it triggered it. And it was like, oh, wait a second, what happened? A couple of days later, it triggered the other. And so there we are sitting in cash late 2007. And he's mad at me at, at first because he's like, why did you sell this stock? This is just a blip. And I was like, well, um, you know, we did this because, you know, this is what it, this is what the chart tells to do, right? And and then we started seeing the stock continue to drop. And he's like, well, what am I doing with the cash? And I was like, I don't know what we should do with the cash. Let's hold on. And so we held on in cash for a year, guys. My wife starts a dental practice in December 28th, 2008. Goes to, of all places, Bank of America. And gets a big dental practice loan, seven hundred thousand dollar dental practice loan. January six, two thousand and nine. I'm sitting in a conference in Orlando, Florida, listening to a man named Nelson Nash talk about how we can become our own banker, how we can get rid of the snakes and dragons, as he liked to talk uh, uh, talk about the banks. And I was reading in his book on the flight home about how families could be operating together. And do this. And I thought, wait a second, my father in law has been sitting here with cash, not knowing what to do with it. Both of us are scared to death to invest it again because we don't know. Are, are we at the bottom? <laughs> is this is this halfway to the bottom? But yet, if if he 
has access to the cash. My wife's over here lending, borrowing money from the same bank that his cash is just sitting there. Whose money are they lending, Ernie? Yours. They're, yeah, they're lending my father-in-law's money to his daughter at 7.95%. And what, what do you think, Eric, they were paying my father-in-law on all that cash he was sitting? Do you think they were paying him 8.5%? <laughs> they, they're paying a little less than that. Yeah. So here, here we go. I got, I got my father-in-law sitting in a cash position, my wife borrowing money for her business. And I said, let's put this thing together and let me show you how to do it. And we set up a legal agreement, did all of the arrangements with the insurance companies to, to collateralize the loan in case the, the place burned down. We set up an insurance policy on my wife that he's funding with the the, the payment that she was making to Bank of America starts making it to him. And we start stacking cash in a place that he can access. Now, what have oh. I done? I've taken him out of a position of being earning zero and being very scared um, and concerned about what investing would look like for him in the future to a position where now he is earning a guaranteed rate of return from my wife. And who do you think my wife wants to make the payment to, Mark? Bank of America or her dad? Family. It's all about keying. 100%. Because here's the key, is that if he doesn't spend all the money that she repays him, who's going to get access to some of that money? All in the family. Yeah, it's going to be all in the family. And I, I think that there's an opportunity here that you're learning about how money works. You're learning how to become a better investor. You're learning how to build passive income streams, yet your parents aren't. And they don't want to learn. Most of them don't want to learn. But there's an opportunity for them to be able to invest with you. And you shouldn't take that lightly. You need to have the, the experience to do that responsibly. But as you do that, you should be talking to them and helping them get money out of these banks earning zero to two and a half or three percent. I know rates are increasing, so maybe they're getting three and a half percent. But still, that's a fraction of what you might be learning how to use it to make, right? So right, that's my, gonna be my final thought, Mark, and coming to you, we'll, we'll get everybody's final thought, we'll wrap up. Final thought, I'm gonna circle back to my original thought, which is FOMO. There is the fear of missing out as the market's going up. There's the fear of missing out if it's going down, but I wanna challenge your fear of missing out. What are you missing out on right now when you lock those dollars up into that system? Because fast forward, to the people who have now quote retired and their fear of missing out is the fear that if they actually do the things that they were told they could do in retirement, they're going to run out of money. So what are they really missing out on? Mm -hmm. And that's always my biggest fear because quality of life is normally worth more than any of us are willing to pay. And if you sacrificed your entire quote working adult life to get to this point where you're supposed to be able to join things and now you can't because you're worried and you, you have a fear that you're going to miss out on the ability to put food on the table. That doesn't sound like a lot of fun to me. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to give that one a hard pass. Mm, I agree. Earn final thought. Yeah. I'll come back to my first thought as well, which is just the summary of this fascination with the diversion. <laughs> you brought this up about uh, taking, taking some drug by Pfizer. Uh, of course you would take that. The, the problem in the financial world is that we're, we're fascinated with treating symptoms. Mm. And that's what that's what Wall Street is doing is treating symptoms, the symptoms of, hey, we're practicing good modern portfolio theory. <laughs> We've got great allocations. We're outperforming the market. Maybe uh, we're not talking about the fees that we're collecting. We'll give you a meeting one time a year just so that you can stay on target. No more than that, because that's not good for you. Uh, we'll make sure that we're setting you up for a good retirement, or at least we'll make it seem like you're on the journey when the disease is the person who's entrusting those dollars remains out of control. <laughs> lack of understanding and lack of access to their own cash as Eric was talking about. So that's the problem, the fascination with diversion. If we can keep you focused on the urgent, just think about the crypto craze that we just went through. We'll keep you from focusing on the things that are really important, which is your understanding, your access to cash, the deals that you can do that gets you freedom today. That's my final thought. Jamie, I'd hate to have to follow that, but you have to. That is a tough one to follow, Russ. Ernie, that was that, ooh, that was deep. You know, I, my final thought, Nelson Nash always says, and 
for me if I get this a little backwards, but if you know the problem or understand the problem, you know what to do. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people don't understand the problem. And, you know, if you're listening to this, uh, you probably fall into a couple camps, either you fully understand the problem and you probably actively taking action to, uh, to know what to do and move on to your next steps, or you're trying to find a better way. Right. And so I would just encourage people to invest in themselves. Um, you know, one of the a great way to do that would be talk to us. We're happy to get into more detail on, on a call and, and talk you through your current situation. Um, you know, we get together with people all the time and just mastermind around what's going on or just invest instead of putting that extra $5,000 into a Roth every year, invest in yourself, invest in an education program to, to look at alternatives or to buy books or to study something that may give you a better option than what you're currently doing. Mm, very good. JD. Uh, Ronald Reagan uh, once said that uh, uh, some of the, the nine most terrifying words in the English language are I'm from the government and I'm here to help. And uh, I think that perfectly also relates to Wall Street, right? Um, because who better to have your best interest in mind than you? And um, because you know what you want for your family better than anybody knows what you want for your family. Um, and uh, And I just think that they've, they've made it so complicated and so complex that people feel almost trapped as if that's the only option when the reality is, is that it's not. Um, and you're far better off of you taking control of that than you lending it to someone else to take control of it for you. So good. All right, Eric, wrap us up, man. I think everyone has been given a measure of discernment in their life. And I can prove that for every listener by thinking back on the times that you've walked out of your house or and thought, am I forgetting something? Or you just knew something didn't feel right only late to later to discover that, gosh, I should have listened to that little feeling. Well, I, I think all of us can say when we were throwing money into that um, 401 or 401k qualified plan, we just got the sense that something about this doesn't feel right. I would just tell you to listen to that little discernment, listen to your gut and follow what these guys are saying. Each one of them are saying, invest in yourself, invest in your education. When you know better, you'll do better. Hey, Jamie, it's OK. She, she wants to get in the picture. She looks a lot better than you do. By the way, This is the beauty. <laughs> this is what financial freedom looks like is when you can have your kids sit on your lap while you're doing a podcast. And you're talking about the Wall Street way, because I'm going to say most people are not able to have that sort of ability, right? Because we are so connected to our work and our work has taken us away from those that we love. And so, so grateful that um, I get to do this with you. Uh, I'm so grateful that you're listening to this podcast, right? There's opportunities out there. If you don't know exactly the problem the, the easiest way to better understand it is to jump on a call. Go to withwhatwallstreet.com forward slash free call. And one of these coaches will take 15 minutes with you, help better understand what you're trying to do and give you insight. If it makes sense, they'll go deeper with you. Otherwise, they'll point you to a resource, point you toward a podcast, maybe uh, point you to a connection that would help you on that journey. But what we want is you to to have the ability to, to choose the next step in life. It doesn't mean leaving work. Only if leaving work is the thing that is keeping you from being free to excel in whatever passion it is that you have. I don't think the six of us will, will ever leave. We love doing this. This is fun. Now, we don't want to do it with 80 hours a week, but it is, it is enjoyable because we get to do it because um, it's something that has helped us get to where we are. So grateful for you. Uh, please take time if you haven't already. Rate and review the show. Uh, that's how other people find us, how we beat the big tech algorithm. Don't don't fall for it. Wall Street is absolutely trying to push this down. <laughs> they do not want this message out there. So your your comments, your reviews, your your shares are what help us get across that finish line. Have an amazing day. This has been the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show to break free of the Wall Street mindset and begin building wealth on your own terms in places you understand so that your wealth will never run dry. See you next episode.